have a rather unusual topic for you this morning. My wife and I were talking about it in the car on the way to church, and she said, that doesn't sound like the usual kind of Sunday morning topic. And in a way, it isn't. What I would like to do and have been doing in the course of the last several months is taking you collectively for a little peek into the behind-the-scenes activities of the board meetings that we had. We talked about the purposes of a church. And our board reached the same conclusion that other church boards reach, that there are four purposes for a church. One of them is for worship. We looked at that in the month of February. One of them is for witness. We looked at that in the month of March. One of them is for fellowship. We looked at that in the month of January. And the fourth one is the hardest one to define. In fact, we changed the word about four times, though we knew what we wanted. We didn't know what word would best describe it. And we wound up with the word that is the most descriptive but the least understood. The fourth purpose is nurture. Now, that's going to be May. That's not where I'm going this morning. Because in the month of May, we are going to try something just a little different in the morning services, not in the service, but as a result of them. You're going to receive some family projects and some Bible questions to go along with the sermons in May that you can do as a, as a unit at home. And uh, there'll be some where if there aren't children in the family, there, or if there are two adults together, they can work on them. Some challenge to Bible study that will come out of the morning services. We hope that it will be a nurture experience. Those four purposes are a standard textbook result. We took 15 men, 16 men, 12 board members and four staff members, put us into a room, started with a blank piece of paper, and wound up with the same four purposes for a church that everybody else winds up with, whether they're talking about it from an academic structure or a denominational structure. We all wind up with the same purposes. They're common to all churches. It doesn't make any difference if you're in a Baptist church, a Presbyterian church, a Lutheran church, a, a Pentecostal church. Those same four purposes are going to be involved in that assembly. When you begin to realize that, you begin to ask yourself a question. If all of those purposes are going to be in every kind of assembly, regardless of the brand label on the outside of the can, why are we here? Why is there such a group of people as this composite body of people sitting in this room this morning? What's, why does Bethesda exist? A couple of years ago on the campuses of the colleges of the United States, the biggest questions were something like this. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And what's going to happen when I get it done? What's the end result? Those four questions were occupying the minds of young people on college campuses. It spread out through the ranks of people out in the street in different ways until the psychologists began to convince us that we had an identity crisis. Women had to discover what was the role of women. Children had to discover what's the role of the child. Men have to discover what is the role of the man. Families have to discover what's the role of the family. People are looking at the love and the self-image in their mind as an identity crisis. Why am I here? Who am I? What kind of a person? What makes me unique among all the other people around here? When you have an identity crisis individually, there's great emotional upheaval. When you have an identity crisis politically, there's a revolution. When you have an identity crisis corporately, there's economic disaster. People, government, business, and churches need to know who they are and why they are there. Now, you see, I said I have an unusual subject. This morning isn't going to be perhaps as much preaching as it is, I hope, instruction and challenge for people to think, for us to think. How do differences between churches begin? The first difference that comes up is a very obvious one. Turn to the book of Ezra, 
the 10th chapter, book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 10. And we'll look at the 11th verse, please, of Ezra 10. Ezra is speaking up, talking to the people of Israel and laying before them things that they have done that are wrong. And in verse 11, he says, Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will and separate yourselves from the peoples of the land. And in this particular case, from the wives that they had accumulated because of what they were doing. In the Old Testament, you consistently have God saying to his people, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Some people, because of those passages, went to an extreme that was a philosophy called monasticism. They said, if I'm going to be separated from the world, I've got to be in just an enclave that is totally self-sustained. And so in the closing time of the Dark Ages, the monastics came to the, to the fore. To separate yourself from the world, you had to have a little cubicle room in a room where, uh, in a building where it was only other people like yourself. The ultimate example of that was a man by the name of Simon, who is today called Saint Simon. And he is the patron saint by the Roman Catholic Church of flagpole sitters. St. Simon said, I want to be dependent only upon God and separate from the world. So St. Simon had a pole set in the ground like a flagpole and a platform put on the top of it. And St. Simon lived on the flagpole. Twice or three times a day, he would pass a basket down and it would be filled with food and so forth and the exchange of the clothing and and then he'd pull the basket back up, and Simon lived on his flagpole. He was separated from the world. But St. Simon was not really separated from the world. The world came to his flagpole, and the world put food in his basket. Somebody washed his clothing. Somebody darned his socks. Somebody helped load the basket. Somebody baked his bread. He had no oven up on top of his flagpole. It was a very unrealistic kind of separation. In the word of God, that's recognized. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says in verse 5, I've told you, somewhere in that neighborhood, verse 5, 6, 7, I've told you not to keep co company with any that is such and such a person. And he lists some sin. And then he says, but you can't do that entirely because you'd have to be out of the world. It's with believers who are not like that or are like that that I want you to become separate. You see, the biblical view of separation is that you're not supposed to adopt the philosophy of the world and the viewpoint of the world, but as long as you're alive as a human being, you somehow have to rub shoulders, even though you're separate, without getting touched by it. That's hard for the church. That problem today is not as small as it used to be. There are many today who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, and then say, I'll go back into this group over here where Christ is not taught, and I will associate with that group religiously in the endeavor to do something with the group. Very seldom does that happen. Christians found it necessary, believers in God found it necessary to separate from the world and to come together to strengthen each other's faith, to encourage each other, to help each other. And all the way through the Word of God, you will find that happening. Whether it is the people of Israel in the Old Testament, or whether it is the church, the body of Christ in the New Testament, believers found the need to come together. When they did not find such a need, then the writer of Hebrews says in the 10th chapter in verse 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Because the later it gets in time and the worse conditions in the world get, the more you're going to need each other. The more you need that corporate strength, that encouragement for one another. Acts chapter 18 is the next passage I'd like you to look at. Acts chapter 18. Now you see, for Israel, they got separated from the nations. That's the first big separation. But now you come into the book of Acts and there are some other things that are happening. In Acts chapter 18, 
verse 4. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, and from now on I will go to the Gentiles. Now understand the process. First you had God separating the people of Israel from the world in the Old Testament. Israel was given the job of holding the word of God. Israel failed to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior, as Messiah. Yet they kept on claiming to be God's people because they were Israel. In the book of Acts, they went to these people and proclaimed Christ in resurrection. When they continued resisting, it became necessary for the believing ones to step out of the contact of the nation. Now you have the nations and the nation and a believing core within the nation. So what you see happening is differences beginning to appear. If I can go back with you a little into church history, there was a time when almost all of Christendom fell under the pale of one church. At that particular time, the study of the Word of God just about disappeared. Education fell apart. The arts collapsed. We call that period of time in history the Dark Ages. As that time drew to an end with the Renaissance, the birth of the printing press, a certain man, one day in in concern for what he saw happening in a very practical thing theologically and what he was seeing in the Word of God as he studied, opened the door of his church, walked to the outside with hammer and nail, nailed a paper to the door. On the paper was the longest doctrinal statement probably ever put out in any one place, the most detailed, where Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. I doubt that most of the people that walked by read all of the information on, on Luther's thesis. What Luther was saying, in effect, was what we need to do is return to the book. We need to come out from where the church per se is at this point of time, where the world per se is at this point of time. We need to come out from it, separate ourselves, return to the book, and stand for the truths of God. Again, think in biblical time. After the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the day of Pentecost, the disciples chose to be together. They chose a place called the upper room where they fellowshiped regularly. If you were Peter in the book of Acts and you were looking for a place to encourage your heart after having been sitting in a jail cell for most of the night and suddenly re released by uh, divine interference through the form of an angel, you would want to find some place to go where you could find some harmony. And Peter thought about it after he got out on the streets of the city and realized it finally dawned on him, I'm free. The Lord has opened the door of the jail. He thought about it and he said, I know where to go. I'll go to the home of John Mark's mother because there are always people gathered together in John Mark's home, his mother's home, praying. And he went and knocked on the door. When Paul visited the city of Philippi, he went to visit believers, and he knew where to go. It says, on that morning he went out to the, on the, to the riverside, because that's where prayer was wont to be made. They had to come together by the sheer need of Christian encouragement and sharing in the Word of God. And so you have the birth of groups today we call churches. It exists because of that need, and it's a God-given need. In 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter opens his letter by talking about those who have like precious faith. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, and he says, Timothy, that which you have learned in the midst of many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to do what? Teach others. Pass it on down the line. The first big division that's 
absolutely a necessity, absolutely a necessity, is for Christians to recognize ultimately this truth. They are living in the world, but they are not part of the system. When you read the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it says the amazing thing about Abraham was that he recognized that he was a pilgrim and a stranger on the face of the earth. Now, some people say that makes believers so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. That can happen. It isn't necessary, but it does happen sometimes. When you read the life of Abraham and David and some of those listed in Hebrews 11 and look at them honestly and really pay attention to their lives, they were not that way. They were godly people. But they were godly people who recognized that the 70, 80, 90, or 100 years upon the face of the earth is only a very small spot in the spectrum of eternity. And that spiritual values were worth more than material values. That God's word was worth more than man's thought. And they made a conscious choice. And in making that choice, they were driven to fellowshipping with people who consciously made the same choice. It was necessary. It is very, very hard to be alone, especially in a crowd. I don't know if you've ever been in a class like this, but I've been in, in a Greek class in Bible school, and there were four of us, four students in the Greek class. We were all normally in the upper division grade-wise of our class. But there were only four men taking Greek, and they graded on a curve. That meant one A and one failure out of four A students because it was a hard curve. It wouldn't change it. Well, that was tough. Sometimes you felt like you got so much individual attention that you'd like to sneak off in a corner somewhere and not be noticed by the professor. And then I sat in a class, which I understand today is now kind of a small one, but it was large for then, of about three to 500 students in one classroom. There you could fall asleep, and the professor hardly even knew you were asleep. He hardly even knew you were there. You were a number. There you'd like to stand up and scream and say, why isn't somebody someplace know I'm here? Have you ever been in that kind of a class or experience? Or a factory. When you work on an assembly line in a factory and the same piece of equipment passes by you all day long and you do the same thing all day long, you almost feel like screaming, what difference does it make whether I tighten those five bolts or not? Maybe if I don't tighten them, somebody will know I'm here. Christians need the fellowship of other believers and of necessity that first division is born. The first division is between those that preach the gospel and those that do not. Now, inside the ranks come some multiples. Historically, there have been a lot of reasons for people separating into different groups. Doctrinally, there's covenant theology and dispensational theology. And it's very hard for the two to meet. So it divides into camps. There's Calvinism and Arminianism. What does that mean? Calvinist believes very strongly that God predetermines everything and that when you are saved, you are always saved. The Arminian believes very strongly that man makes up his mind about everything, and if he makes up his mind to get rid of his salvation, he gets rid of it. So one is eternal security and one has no security. As a result, there was division. And then there is the charismatic movement and the non-charismatic movement. One of them will say, if you don't speak in tongues, you cannot have the Holy Spirit. And the other one says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you couldn't speak in tongues at all. It'd be impossible. There's a division. There's always been a division between those who baptize and those who do not, and those who baptize one way and those who baptize another. Doctrinally, we will come to the Word of God and see things differently, and it tends to cause some divisions, and we coalesce around that which we believe. Operationally, the church has divided. Let me give you a, a difference. There's congregational government. Congregational government says that leadership is granted by those who are led, with the consent of those who are led. 
those who work on an eldership system, say, has nothing to do with those who are led. We who are leaders appoint the new leaders. So you wind up with congregationally oriented churches, and you wind up with churches that operate on what they call an eldership principle. And they divide. Sometimes all these divisions occur within one so-called denomination. There are faith missions and supporting missions. Do you ever wonder why there are so many missions that teach the same thing? One mission is a faith mission. It says, we operate solely by faith. When our missionaries go out, there's no guarantee how much money is going to come in. There is no guarantee that they're going to have passage coming back. And another mission says, we operate by faith too, but not like that. We believe that God is going to supply this amount of support monthly for the missionary. And by the grace of God, we're going to commit ourselves to raising it for the missionary through the help of the Lord. And we commit ourselves by faith, but they call those sending missions. Before they'll send out a missionary, they have to have so much passage money on hand and they have to have a certain level of support because they've watched the other kind of operation where a missionary gets out on the field and occasionally the money doesn't come in and you have a starving missionary on the field and they can't even get home. You see, So operational differences come about. One of the big operational differences today is who's boss, the board or the pastor? Now, you can pick up church growth books and one side of the question says, the only way a church will grow is if the pastor dictates everything in a church. The other one says, pastor dictates everything in a church, it's a hopeless muck and mire and it'll soon collapse and you've got to have a strong board. Follow our system and the church grows. And churches get divided over that. The one kind of difference that is the worst but occurs the most frequently is probably personality difference. When churches split or divide or new churches are born based on the personality of an individual. Look at the book of Corinthians for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Here you have a biblical example of this. Verse 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 3. You're still carnal. You're still fleshly. There is jealousy and strife among you. Now notice he doesn't say you're fighting over doctrine or organization. It's jealousy. You're fleshly. You're walking like mere men. Because one of you says, I am of Paul. And another says, I am of Apollos. And another one, according to the first chapter, says, I am of Peter. And then there were those, finally, who had the last word. And they said, all the rest of you follow men. But we follow Christ. What was happening? That kind of division was a bad thing. It's the worst kind of all. Now, every church, every group emphasizes its own identity. We are Lutheran. We are Baptist. Every church does that. Every assembly. If, if we're not part of a group, you know what we say? We are independent. We have it as an identity, you see. Every church emphasizes its integrity. We are here because every church emphasizes its own importance. Somebody came to me one day and said, I don't understand why the people of Bethesda think Bethesda is the best church in the city. That's pride. Can I ask you a little question? What do you think the people in the Bloomington Assembly of God think of their church? What do you think the people attending Wooddale Baptist Church or Edina Baptist Church think of theirs? What do you think the people that go to the church, the Colonial Church of Edina? Think about the Colonial Church of Edina. What do you think the people of Crystal Free Church on the north side of town say about Crystal Free Church? Don't you think each one says, well, we're going here because this one is the best church in town? Because for me, it's the best church in town? Each church in turn mellows. Each denomination mellows. If you had met the Baptists when they were called the Anabaptists when they first started out, you would have found one of the feistiest, fightingest groups of people you ever saw in all your life. And if you had met John Calvin and you disagreed with him, you'd stand just as much chance of being burned at the stake by John Calvin as you would have by the church he came out of. Just as much. Why does God let this happen? 
Why? I think it's necessary. That's why God lets it happen. In business, when there is no competition and somebody gets a monopoly, what happens to that monopoly? Does it improve it or does it degenerate the product? When there is competition, there must be advertising and outreach. Debate causes research and study. The Dark Ages, there was no debate, and theologically, the studies went to nothing. If I have to defend what I believe, I go back and I study the Word of God. It makes me a more diligent student. Go out to buy a car. You want to meet people at their best. Now, you see, we bought an Omni. Somebody else might have a Horizon. I heard a dealer for the Omni tell me what was wrong with the Horizon. Now, let me tell you something. They're made on the same assembly line. They have even delivered them to the dealers. Omnis with Horizon stickers on the side. The Aspen and the Volari are the same thing, and I've heard people argue over which is a better car, the Aspen or the, Aspen or the, <laughs> Aspen. the, Aspen or the Volari. One dealer told me the Dodge Challenger is so much better than the Plymouth Sapporo because we've had years of experience. It isn't the same car that they had years of experience with. The Aspen and the Sapporo are run on the same line, and the only difference is the color of the paint on the outside. Four colors belong to Sapporo, and four colors belong to Challenger. Outside of that, the cars are exactly the same. The engine, the engineering, the shock absorbers, the seats, everything. But we argue. Ford, Granada, Mercury, Monarch, same thing. Sunbird, Skyhawk, Starfire, and Monza all run on the same lines. But we argue which is the best. And the owners will fight over it. You see, the automobile manufacturers don't produce just one car. They produce a couple of them. Because there are so many needs and so many likes and so many dislikes and so many different people to market to. Now, Paul faced this issue in 1 Corinthians 11. He talked to them about the differences. And he said the kind of differences they were having in 1 Corinthians 1 were wrong. And differences have a base that is wrong. But he also said this in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 11. There must also be factions. And the word heresy doesn't always mean terribly bad things like we think of it. There must also be heresies, divisions, factions among you in order that those who are approved may become evident among you. It's the differences that bring out the strengths. What welds a marriage together? The easy good days or the days when the husband and the wife have to battle a little bit and work it out? What brings parents and children close together? When the children are wondrously compliant and always do what their parents say? Or when after you've had a little locking of horns between parent and child, and you come back together again, you realize that in spite of the differences, you need each other and you love each other and, and you're stuck with each other. You know? What draws us together? What draws us together? It's facing adversity and difference. It's testing our own thoughts. We know as young people, we have to test our thoughts. We have to weigh them. We have to think them through. And when you test them and you weigh them and you come back, you come back stronger. Now, that brings me to our point of the morning. See, all this is leading up to something. There's a reason why this church is here. We don't provide unique fellowship. We don't provide unique worship. We don't provide unique witness. We don't even provide unique wit uh, nurture. We hope we provide all four of them, like every church wants to provide all four of them, but we are here because of a commitment to a position of what we believe biblically. That's the reason to be for a church. We have a commitment, dispensationally, theologically. We make that commitment. That is our reason to be. Now there's a danger, and I, and I want us to recognize this danger. The danger is when any group, whether it's Bethesda, or Grace Baptist, or Trinity Lutheran of Minnehaha Falls. I'm going to say those three because they're all fine evangelical churches right in the close area. Huh? When any one of us becomes so convinced 
that we don't need the rest of the body of Christ, then we're wrong. When we don't recognize that the multiple things that God has allowed to develop in the church are there because they give a testimony and a witness to the depth of God's word. If every believer everywhere saw everything alike about this book, if there were no differences, we wouldn't need the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, would we? If every believer saw everything exactly alike, how much studying would we have to do? All we'd have to do is be taught when we were four, five, six, seven, eight years old, a system of faith, and then that would be it. We'd know all the answers for the rest of our lives. There'd be no challenge to learn and to study. Watch a Christian young person walk into the college classroom and be challenged by a professor on the origin of life. And the professor say, all right, write a paper on it. Now, I've had some of our young people come into my study, borrow the books and be. I had a young man do that on Wednesday night, not even from Bethesda. But he came in. He's been coming a couple of Sundays. He came in. He said, I'm writing this paper for a psychology class on the effect of the difference of creation and evolution, and I need some help. Will you help me? Show me some books. And he was as eager as he could be because somebody challenged what he believed. He wanted his mind and gear to work. It shows the multifaceted grace of our God. Isn't it marvelous how God can reach out in so many different ways and accomplish his purpose? It shows the love of God reaching to so many in so many different ways. And it shows the continued need of believers for the sustaining grace of God. You see, when you bump up against all those differences, and there are good heads in every one of them, when you bump up against all of those differences, you have to say, God, help us. Help us to start the truth. Help us to grasp the truth. Help us to understand the truth. Make us strong the way we should be strong. Bethesda? has a unique position. You know, hey, BT, I think there was a couple breaks Something in. different about the church of the body of Christ as to where and how it began. And there are some external ramifications to that. But let us not lose sight that we are part of the body of Christ, which is composed of people of other persuasions. Because of that, we are members of Greater Minneapolis Association of Evangelicals. We're, we're part of the National Association of Evangelicals. We're in the Sunday School Association. Because we recognize that. Individuals in a family unit differ, but they're still a family. Family units inside of a family tree differ, but they're still the same family tree. Family trees and nations differ. And nations in the world differ, but they're still all men, human beings. You see, Elijah got wrong. In 1 Kings 19.10, Elijah sat on the mountain top, pouting. He said, God, I'm the only one that's right. The whole world is wrong with me. I'm the only one that's right. I'm the only one that stood faithful. And God said to him, Elijah, you're wrong. I've got 7,000 men who have never bowed the knees to Baal. You're wrong, Elijah. And yet there was John the Baptist. The Lord said about John the Baptist, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a reed shaking in the wind? Or did you go out to see a man of conviction who said what he believed? You see, what God is trying to do is to balance our conviction and our graciousness in a great balance. That demonstrates the grace of God, and it demonstrates it in a very real way. If we are not convicted about what we believe, we'll never take a stand for it. If we do not recognize that others have a right to their conviction and that within the body of Christ there are differing persuasions, we will become very hard and very cold and very exclusivist. They're both extremes. Neither one is right. We are unique because we have a definitive view of Scripture, but we are a part of the body of Christ in which there are many who hold definitive views. And when you read about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, understand that it says one part is not more important than another part. I believe God has a church like Bethesda existing for a reason. I think there's something we can contribute to the body of Christ. Just as there is something that can be contributed by any other theological persuasion. 
God has balanced forces in nature. He has balanced forces in the human body. And in the body of Christ, he has balanced forces. Now, what was the point I tried to make to you this morning? The point I'm trying to make is that churches exist because they believe they have something unique that they can contribute to the body of Christ. Generally, that uniqueness is found in its doctrinal position, not in its operational position. They all come up with the same four purposes, but they may come from a different point of view. So the church will emphasize that point of view. And it's incumbent upon the, the church to emphasize it. It's there. God raised it up for a reason. It's incumbent to emphasize it. But not to develop the kind of feeling that nobody else in the world has any truth whatsoever. That's wrong. The pastor who stands behind the pulpit, regardless of its brand label, wouldn't make any difference what brand label I was or any pastor was. If he did not believe what he was preaching, would he be able to present a very consistent case for his position? Would he be able to uphold that unique reason to be? You see, when our board got done talking, we discovered that the same four purposes unite the church, any church, all churches. But that our reason to be it's not our fellowship. That may be very sweet, but that's not our reason to be. It isn't our missionary outreach. That's very nice, very good, very worthwhile, but it's not our reason to be. Our reason to be is our common belief and how we treat the Word of God. That's the justification for a unit church. Listen, if that wasn't the reason, you know what would have happened when we started growing out of the cities and into the suburbs? Every church in the suburb would have been called Bible Church. Would have been First Bible Church of Richfield, Second Bible Church of Richfield, Third Bible Church of Richfield, Fourth Bible Church of Richfield. That isn't the way it grew. Because people had committed themselves to something that they believed biblically. You have Wooddale Baptist Church, and you have uh, Bloomington Assemblies of God, and you have Edina Baptist Church, and you have Crystal Free Church. Because when people step out of the city into the new area, they coalesce again around what? around some point of commonality in what they believe. So when you boil it down, the reason to be for a church is what it believes. And it should believe that firmly and strongly and with conviction, and with convictions based upon the Word of God, at the same time demonstrating to every other part of the body of Christ the same kind of grace and interaction that the members of our physical body have to demonstrate with one another for us to survive in the world. May God help us to recognize the interplay in the body of Christ, the church, all believers, to take a stand for what we see to be biblical truth, and at the same time to demonstrate the grace of God to those who do not necessarily see eye to eye with us on all points. And I think if we could operate like that in the body of Christ, I think it would bring a great deal of honor and glory to our Lord. Don't you? And isn't that really why we're here, all of us, some total? When we don't operate that way, we have Corinth on our hands all over again. And read the mess they have there.